Hi, my name is Danny Lawrence. Um, very nice to meet you all here in Korea, in Seoul. Uh, for me, it's the first time in this beautiful country. I like it a lot. I went uh, to the Lotte Tower yesterday, uh, five, more than 500 meters high, very impressive. Uh, and I know that there's much more to see and uh, also very good foot over here. Uh, so very nice to meet you. Um, before we start, maybe a little disclaimer. Um, I'm working for the company Bayer AG, uh, located in Germany. Uh, however, I'm giving this presentation today uh, as being a member of the ICH E2B R3 expert working group. And so uh, the content and uh, maybe opinions that I'm stating, those are mine and are not to be associated with the company Bayer as such. Uh, a little bit of background. Uh, so as you have already heard, I think she said in Korean, I'm working for more than 20 years in pharmacovigilance. That's quite a lot. I'm always surprised uh, to look back uh, to all this time I've been working. Uh, in the beginning um, in the systems area. So I have implemented with the European countries, uh, and as you know, there are many of them, uh, E2B exchange uh, in 2005 to 2007. I've connected more than 20 uh, health authorities via E2B. So I have a big history in E2B as such. Uh, back then it was on the E2B R2 standard. We're gonna talk about this a little bit. Um, after that, um, I have moved into more the single case uh, processing role, the ICSR case processing role, as being the uh, leading a, a group in Sao Paulo, uh, entering more than 200,000 cases per year into our database. Uh, we are using at Bayer the Argus database, but also other databases are established and are connected with E2B with regulatory authorities. So that's uh, for my background here. Um, as I already said, I'm working uh, in the expert working group as such. I'm the topic lead for E2B uh, for FPIA, that's the European uh, Pharmaceutical Trade Association. And I'm also working with the SIOMS uh, 14 working group uh, on artificial intelligence in pharmacovigilance, which is a brand new topic, but we're not gonna talk about that today. Um, and you are happy to contact me on LinkedIn uh, as I'm very happy to meet you all there. Uh, today we're going to talk uh, about E2B, uh, so the uh, data elements for transmission of ICSRs, uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about the principles, uh, the guideline itself, uh, of course, the implementation aspects, uh, and then what's currently going on. And I will try to give you a little bit of update what's going on uh, during the presentation already, but there's also a lot of content actually. Uh, now the team is meeting in Prague again this year, uh, so you're going to learn uh, today also what's maybe coming in the future. Um, as you already know from the agenda, there is a second uh, presentation on E2B uh, today, right after my presentation, after a short break, uh, Ms. Lee gonna present some of the regional Korean aspects to you, um, and we have uh, aligned a little bit the content, uh, so it's supposed to be nice two sessions for you on E2B today. Uh, in the expert working group, you've learned about ICH, so I don't need to go there, but here there are some members uh, listed uh, who is actually part of the E2B working group in ICH. Um, we have started in a relatively small group, uh, but meanwhile, luckily, there's a lot of regulators uh, that have joined us in addition, uh, and I think we are very keen on getting more and more uh, regions connected and countries connected through E2B, uh, while they should be following the standard, uh, but of course, they have room for some regional adaptations. Um, but so you can see right now here who is actually currently uh, working with us in the expert working group and who is the rapporteur. Uh, the, um, he's from PMDA and then we have a regulatory co-chair from the FDA. So um, I know some of you, um, most of you are very familiar with pharmacovigilance, but just let me explain to you the, the principle here. Um, uh, one more time, for maybe for the ones that don't know it, what is an ICSR, an individual case safety report, uh, needs to be uh, exactly talking about one patient, that's important, and then that a patient um, should have been at an adverse event uh, reported by at least one reporter. Uh, can be more than one event, but needs to be at least one, uh, and there needs to be at least one suspect medicinal product involved, uh, but there can also be more. So that's kind of the minimum criteria. Uh, most of you know this, but this is quite important as you will see some technical implementation later uh, that the guideline builds upon, which is really, um, requiring uh, that these conditions are met. Why do we need E2B? Um, as you know, ICH-E, uh, the guidelines, is an, it's an efficacy guideline, um, and we really uh, need to look back a little bit to, to understand why E2B is so important. Uh, so if you're working in, uh, as a regulator or uh, also as a, a pharma company, you are receiving adverse event reports um, adverse event reports in all types of fashion. So somebody could send, just send you an email, they might contact you through the call center, 
um, they might send you a structured form that they have built uh, in-house. Um, I hope it's good to see. Otherwise, uh, you're going to see this in the in the slides that are shared. Um, but what all this, this has in common, um, there are some structured and unstructured data that flows into you, um, and it's uh, actually very diverse and complex, the raw documents that you receive. Uh, I've not even listed phone calls or, or, or p uh, adverse events that your staff uh, becomes aware and they need to report, right, in their electronic form. So it's, it's quite extreme. It's very diverse, very complex. You have also social media and also not on this, um, where a lot of adverse events are generated potentially. So what's the requirement of, uh, of us really to protect patient safety is to put all this information into a structured into a database and, uh, and perform some signal detection, right? So we need to make sure that the risk benefit profile of the products are still intact. And in order to do this, E2B was necessary because um, we have to make sure that we can exchange uh, all these uh, very unstructured and, and kind of complex information in a meaningful and effective way. That's why it's uh, an e-guideline. We need to expedite the exchange. Yeah? We have to be quick in order to not miss out on signals. Uh, and we also have to make sure that we're exchanging information that can be digested from a computer uh, without any additional human touch, ideally. I know this is maybe <laughs> still a vision, yeah, but we are striving to go to this vision. And uh, I would say E2B at least has meanwhile succeeded uh, that information can be exchanged uh, without a lot of uh, redundant work. If you think about the stru uh, structured forms again, uh, in the past, people had to transcribe manually by hand everything that they've received, and then you send it to the next party, they transcribe again, they uh, send it to the next party, they transcribe again. That's not efficient. That's cost a lot of money. This money is better spent on other activities to protect patient safety, for sure. Uh, so the standard format is really what E2B is about. Uh, so what is the principle and objective then? Uh, E2B describes the data elements for the ICSR, uh, and it describes how the information is supposed to be communicated. And these are very long sentences, but just look at what's underlined. I think these are the two core uh, items, and, um, and the standard is supposed to be making sure that without any manual effort, uh, without conversion or re-entering, we can exchange this information uh, efficiently. Um, what's important is that this really describes um, the, the data elements. Uh, it does not define necessarily um, how to code <laughs> an adverse event. Yeah, there are other guidelines like MEDRA um, to, to read about and to understand how, the, how this data is actually supposed to be generated. What is a serious adverse event? What is non-serious, right? So this is not controlled by the guideline. The guideline describes how a serious case is supposed to be technically sent from one system to the other, so the receiving system still knows that this event is a serious event, right, that the right information is exchanged. Um, so there was a quite a success of E2B, of course it's already quite old, uh, but since the beginning of the E2B uh, guideline, what was seen in the early 2000s was that there was a rise of reports, as I mentioned, a lot of sources, patient became much more aware, so we have to deal with a lot of uh, growth, more and more adverse events are reported. Uh, and E2B was quite a success because with the standard in place, um, regulators and pharmaceutical companies have been able to somewhat keep up with, this, uh, with these numbers uh, of rising adverse events. And I think what I would like to point out is um, think a few years back when there was the COVID pandemic and there were um, some agencies in the European Union, and I think this was probably everywhere, uh, that had a surge in adverse event reports. Out of a sudden, they had 20 times more adverse events than before. 20 times, right? And, and you know, if you would be buried in paper, you would not be able to do your signal assessment uh, for these vaccines and to see is there anything going on. So E2B, I think, really has helped also to identify signals uh, early, right, which would have probably been impossible without the standard being in place. So huge success. Um, what are the use cases? Um, as you can read, uh, but I will explain also a little bit um, Primarily, the standard was developed for exchange between um, pharmaceutical companies, between regulators, between regulators and pharmaceutical companies, um, and then, of course, also for exchange with the WHO. Uh, meanwhile, I think it has been you know, so successful that there are two new use cases uh, that have been established. So, so the one is, uh, is the sub-bullet point in the pharmaceutical company to pharmaceutical company, 
So there is the da uh, data migration bullet point. And I think it's quite interesting. I mean, we want to use this format E2B for exchange data expeditedly. So it goes uh, within the 15 days or seven days to the regulators. Uh, but we've also used it now, and it's quite common, to exchange, uh, for example, if a company is bought or a product is sold, uh, you need to exchange the safety database uh, for this product that uh, E2B is used in order to do the data migration. Yeah. Before this, it was quite expensive to do a data migration. Now, since the systems are usually supporting E2B, uh, data migration can make use of that. Uh, the secondary application, and I need to underline that this is off standard, yeah, uh, but it has been very much established that for the exchange of, of let's say, raw data, E2B is also used. So some companies, for example, have um, websites where consumers can enter their adverse events. And those adverse events are then sent to the safety system in E2B. But it's not a complete ICSR yet. Uh, it has no medical assessment, and some data needs to be structured that the patient just put in, typed what has happened. Uh, but they have maybe coded already something. They have maybe described uh, their age, their gender, uh, things that are important from the patient characteristics point of view. Uh, so the secondary application exchange of raw data is quite important for companies, especially pharmaceutical companies, uh, to receive raw data in a format that the safety database can already understand and also helps uh, then with an uh, efficient data processing later on. So the history of the E2B guideline, <laughs> now when you see this, 1997, like I said, this is so long ago, 25 years ago, um, but this is when it all started. So this guideline has uh, quite a long history already. Um, I think, you know, you don't need to really learn and understand uh, each one of those steps, uh, but what is really important is that in the beginning, e the E2B standard uh, was really uh, from ICH only. Um, but then in 2006, there were some strategic decisions made uh, similar to other ICH guidelines that technical implementation uh, should be um, built up upon um, the use of, of standards that are developed by, uh, stand, uh, by standard development organizations, STO. So for ICH, this was ISO. Um, so the ISO standard had been developed um, an ICSR standard, uh, and this then has been uh, taken up by the E2B group and uh, built an ICH uh, implementation upon it. Now, you might know this, uh, but I think it's important because this, this previous standard, which is called E2B R2, yeah, so R2 was the first one, now we have R3, but the R2 standard is still in place uh, in a lot of uh, settings. So, for example, uh, company, big companies are still sending E2B R2 files to the FDA, yeah, uh, where uh, other agencies are connected through R3, uh, some are insisting on R3 exchange, uh, some are not, some some give the option to use R2 or R3. Um, the differences are quite quite uh, yeah, small from the content. Uh, it's really the exchange format uh, and that this uh, that the E2B R3 um, message is built upon this uh, HL7 standard, uh, which was developed uh, with ISO. Yeah. So last um, last item here that's also highlighted since 2016. You can see this. Uh, since 2016, the standard has been uh, pretty stable. Uh, there have been then a, que a question and answer document uh, that has been you know, further built upon uh, since then, but uh, no major change after 2016 to the standard. Um, the expert working group is still in place in order to make sure that the standard uh, keeps being um, you know, fresh. <laughs> uh, and if changes are coming our way, that uh, we can open a revision. So I already explained a little bit of this um, again. Um, this is all a lot of uh, data regarding the history. Uh, the important piece is really that the, the current standard R3 uh, was built together with ISO, uh, and ISO built it with HL7, the underlying characteristics. Uh, so this is a standard which is not invented by ICH. It is implemented as on top of the ISO ICSR standard. Um, so this is something which should support uh, then the um, facilitation of the data exchange, not just in the E2B world, uh, but also for healthcare systems overall, like when you um, connect hospital systems, for example. Okay, um, let's look into the implementation guide as such. As I mentioned, uh, this is an efficacy guideline, um, and ISO and HL7 built uh, the standard, which then ICH uh, built the ICSR standard on top of this. Um, I think the, the, other, the other piece that uh, was really invented here um, with the R3 standard is that there was now room for regional um, modifications of the standard. 
Um, so since E2BR3, uh, the regions have the chance to officially uh, include more data fields uh, and, and have a regional implementation guide really um, where I think ICH as such, uh, the ICH group as such would like to keep it as much as possible to the standard itself. So the, the data entry guidances around the world and the interpretation of the E2B message uh, is, is everywhere the same. Uh, they understand that uh, in certain jurisdictions, data elements, additional data elements are required. Uh, so we have, um, in, in, in Korea, we have um, regional fields, which we will learn about later in the, in the other presentation. We have in Europe, we have special fields, we have special fields uh, also in the US. So there's, um, you know, there was, in order to get alignment on a, on a global level, uh, then there needs to be some compromise that certain uh, additional data elements can be put in. So I think this was a big achievement that uh, despite uh, those needs, uh, there could be an, an, a global standard achieved. Um, now this is very important for the ones that need to go even uh, deeper into the standard. Uh, so because we only have 45 minutes today, uh, I won't be able to cover all of this. Uh, so there, I, I just show you basically what's available, what's officially available on the ICH global level. Um, so when you go to the ICH website, uh, you can always download the latest package and I would really recommend you to do that. There is a, a, a link in the last slide um, where I have a little link collection um, which brings you to the ICH page where you can download that. Um, what is important for you is really the, the number one and not so much the history, uh, but the current implementation guide. I think this is the, the most important document uh, to read and to study so you can really, if you are, um, for example, responsible for a technical PV system, a database that is supposed to digest or report E2B, this implementation guide is for you because it will uh, give you all the details, uh, all the instructions, uh, which data elements are where, uh, which data types to be used, which code lists to be used for which fields, are there any restrictions and, and so on. Uh, and it will explain to you basically um, all the principles. It's a long document. Yeah? So it's really for the ones that need to be uh, implementing this on a technical level. Um, in addition to this, uh, there is uh, a backwards forwards compatibility, this is called BFC document, uh, that has been established uh, in order to yeah, facilitate really the conversion between those two standards, R2 and R3, as I said, are very similar content-wise, so there is a backwards forwards compatibility um, you know, conversion possible. It's, it's connected, of course, with a little bit of data loss, uh, yeah, because the, the new standard, the R3 standard, is a little bit more advanced. Uh, but still, uh, I think it's an acceptable approach to convert using this. And for the EU, there's also a tool uh, provided. Um, then you have uh, reference instances, so you can see examples of ICSR messages, how should they look like, how should acknowledgements look like. We talk about acknowledgements uh, later today. Um, and, and in addition, there are the code lists, uh, more technical information uh, further, further deep down. Um, that explain to you really how to certain code lists are to be used uh, and, and how to uh, retrieve those code lists uh, from, other safe, uh, from other systems. And since this is quite frequently updated, I mean, this is March 2022, uh, so a little bit more than a year, I would still recommend to you um, to, you know, regularly go and check if there are any updates, if you're responsible for such a system, at least for the Q&As, they are often very helpful additions. Now, uh, this is basically the core of it, of the standard, uh, because it describes uh, the technical details, the, the data elements. Um, and I have uh, on purpose, let me go up here, uh, put the legend um, very big, because I don't want you to go through all of this. Um, also in the next presentation, we're gonna have a little bit more time to look into all those data fields. Uh, what's important uh, here really is, is to understand this piece there, how to read it. Because if you get your hands on the implementation guide or you look into the slide, you need to understand uh, what this is. And so I think there, the important piece is really there, there is a one-to-one -one mandatory. So this uh, black uh, circle, black fi uh, filled circle um, with a straight line that shows you that there must be and, and should not be more than one element. So for example, there needs to be one identifier yeah, one case identifier, and there needs to be one patient. And if you see this example in the, in the pink box, there needs to be exactly one patient. But then 
from the patient characteristics, you can see that, that multiple, so like this multiple lines uh, are representing this, that there are multiple uh, elements possible. So you have, and we call it also repeatable elements. Yeah, so a patient can have been, it could have been exposed to multiple products. That's typically the norm. Yeah, uh, but there can only be one patient. So you cannot put two patients into one ICSR. That's impossible. Uh, you need two cases, two ICSRs that need to be sent in order to describe this. So if you have a literature article talking about two patients which, which can be distinguished, you need to create two cases. And the reason for that, or one of the principles really is that uh, the ICSR message uh, is supposed to carry exactly one patient information. Um, the other piece that I wanted to point out uh, are the, the circles which, which are not filled black, but uh, which are filled white or not filled. Um, it says optional, but what does optional mean? I, and I want to stress that a little bit because it's often misinterpreted. Optional sometimes is interpreted as I don't have to provide this information. It doesn't matter. I don't have to structure it. But you have to structure it if you have it. Optional just means if you don't have it, there, there's a lot of reasons why you don't have it, and then it's okay, then you, you, it's still a valid ICSR message. Please send the message with the maximum information that you have, uh, but don't consider optional being, I have the data, but I don't put it into the ICSR message. Yeah, so just, uh, just be clear, always provide the maximum information, try to structure it as, as good as possible into those many fields, uh, and optional means if you have it, please report it, but there are uh, situations which are understood that are not, um, where you don't have this information. I skip over all the details uh, in, in the individual fields because we're gonna see this in the next session, uh, but I wanna um, go here on the, on the code sets and vocabularies from the bottom. You see from the bottom, the first one that comes up is the null flavor. Let me see, this is so tiny. I hope you can see what I'm marking here. So from the bottom, it says null flavor. Uh, so sometimes um, you cannot provide information because the, the patient did not allow you to forward this information, for example. Um, so then this is a situation where you can have a masked null flavor, for example. So masked means you are in possession of the information, but you are not allowed to forward it. So there are multiple null flavors uh, that goes beyond the optional. Let me go back. So optional um, means you, you don't provide it at all, but you may provide it but in a null flavor way. So you tell, I, have, I don't have the information, but I have asked for it. Or I have the information, but I cannot give it to you because, it's, uh, because of data privacy reasons. Yeah, these are null flavors. Um, and then ICH, E2B also, of course, did not want to reinvent the wheel. Um, and together with this M2 group, ICH M2, uh, which is a technical consultancy group, um, you have, oh, yeah, defined uh, certain types of code lists which are repurposed or reused yeah, because they were internationally agreed, uh, like MEDRA, uh, we look into this in a sec, MEDRA, um, and so you can make use of MEDRA in an ICH message, ICSR message, I mean, E2B message, and you don't have to come up with a new way of coding uh, events and, and patient history. Uh, so ICH, E2B tries to use as many um, agreed code lists as possible um, except for the ones in the middle, ICH maintained code sets. So there are some uh, that, that where there is no reference uh, and, and uh, we will look into this, uh, what, are, what are examples. Um, the first type of uh, code list, let's say, is IDMP. And this, is, has, this has been the one which was the, yeah, still, or still is the most difficult to implement. Um, so if you remember what I said in the beginning, um, E2B messages should be should make it possible to transmit information from one party to the other without re-entering or recoding. Unfortunately, the one element where this is often not possible is the medicinal product. So what was the suspect product? Um, IDMP, the, uh, this, this ISO IDMP standard um, has been developed, but it is not fully in place yet, as you might know. Um, so certain elements are available, others are not. And um, where I will not go into, into all of this, this is just explaining to you what are the different uh, elements that describe a medicinal product. Um, what, what happens in reality is that the name of the product, like aspirin, uh, is, is put into a field and is then transmitted. Aspirin, tablet, um, with a certain strength, let's say 80 milligram strength, is then transmitted, um, but whoever receives that message needs to then look up what is aspirin, 
uh, 80 milligrams tablet in my dictionary because there is no internationally agreed dictionary. There, is, there are some, but they are not mandatory for E2B use. Uh, I know that Korea is quite advanced on this and you're, you're implementing something on the MPID level, which is great, um, but on the global level, this is still missing. So I think this is the key slide for that. Um, since IDMP is not available yet on a global level, um, each region can, uh, until the IDMP identifiers are available, can come up with other coding methodologies. Uh, and and um, the WHO coding is used, for example, this C3 coding, uh, we've seen this now also being implemented in Mexico. So there are some, some good you know, starting points, but unfortunately not on a global level uh, really agreed. We hope that this uh, is gonna be solved one day and then the exchange of product information can be as seamlessly as for other elements, like for example, for MEDRA elements. So when you code at the adverse event, uh, the dictionary that's used as MEDRA, probably you're familiar with that. I won't go into too much detail. Yeah, just looking, I see some people nodding. So, um, so MEDRA describes, uh, uh, is allowing you to code uh, patient history, cause of death, um, the adverse event itself, and then there is a five level hierarchy uh, where often or typically the lowest level term is used and you can transmit this and MEDRA has been ex like outstanding I think in supporting this database to database exchange because it's um, translated in multiple languages. There's still one code. It's very well maintained. There are two versions every year that are released. And so uh, E2B is really benefiting from the MEDRA standard because there is no doubt about the, uh, these elements, no doubt about what adverse event uh, really uh, was coded here. Uh, then the ICH code sets, so these are the ones I said, uh, they are not um, kind of defined on a global level uh, elsewhere. That's why the ICH E2B uh, group had to come up with its own uh, lists. And I have put a little blue arrow next to ICH study type because this is going to be updated probably soon this code list. I will tell you a little bit later about that. Um, but then there's kind of an overseeable, still long list um, of, um, yeah, of, uh, of code lists that are still uh, used and had been established by the age group, as, uh, by the ICH group as such. Um, and then uh, maybe, so, so then <laughs> what, does that, what does that mean? So in the end, um, the gender of a patient, for example, is then described uh, with a certain number and you have to look up uh, the number in the implementation guide. So the implementation guide gives you all of those codes um, typically, or it's telling you where to look up those codes. And so you can then uh, understand an incoming E2B message or create an outgoing message. So these, these lists are then uh, explained in the implementation guide, uh, what the numbers, what the codes actually mean. So in the end, the E2B message, if you have ever seen one, you will see one in the next presentation. Uh, it's a quite technical message with a lot of codes. You don't see much text. There, there's many numbers and, and codes uh, and all referencing to, to certain code lists where you can see then what is the gender of my patient, for example. Um, the UCOM uh, international standard code sets, for example, the, these are a little bit different. They have now been established also as like they were ICH code lists in the past. Now, UCOM is maintaining the code lists. Those are, for example, uh, units of measurements. Um, so you can uh, look up what kilogram uh, stands for, what is, the, what is the representation of kilogram. This has been also um, kind of an advancement with the R3 standard uh, nowadays to code these um, values and units. Let's talk a little bit about the messaging itself. Um, so you, what you have seen until now was kind of the message and how the message is created. What, is, what it, does the message contain? Which data elements? Now you have kind of your final ICSR message. You, have, you know everything about your patient, what happened, and now you have to send it to somebody. To, let's say you're, um, you're a pharmaceutical company, you have to now send it to the regulator, as in this example, sender and receiver. Um, it is absolutely crucial <laughs> Uh, if we have structured such a nice message that it doesn't get lost, right? This is the word that's worst that can happen. Uh, it's like in previous times, you have a paper, you give it to the doctor, the doctor is supposed to give it to the regulator, it gets lost, yeah, no, no oversight. So in order for this not to happen, there's quite a big scheme of message and acknowledgements uh, that was uh, put in place with the ICH standard uh, in order to make sure that um, everyone knows where this document currently sits and that it does not get lost 
Um, so if you look from the top, what happens first is that you send the ICSR or multiple ICSRs in a batch me uh, message to, let's say, the regulator in this uh, place. Um, this often is a, we call it gateway to gateway connection, yeah, or there's an upload of the document, but there's a certain technical step involved. And um, this little clock here, this symbolizes that once the upload was successful or the message was sent to the, to the other party's gateway, this is when the clock stops. Yeah, right? We have usually like 15, depends on the regulation, 15, seven day time to report a case. And once this message is received, the clock stops. Yeah, so this is your compliance. Um, now what can, what does it not tell you is whether this message was actually readable. Yeah, you might have sent um, an, an incorrect file. It was not an ICSR or there was a formatting error. So after this gateway compliance topic is, is over, the regulator would start now to load this case. They have to basically, the, or the system of the regulator will read the case. And uh, when you read this case, a lot of things can go wrong. Um, the message cannot be valid, so there is a formatting error. It's not an ICSR, there, I don't know, there's a weird character in this file. The, the system cannot read the file, cannot open the file, it's corrupt, let's say. Um, or it, uh, it violates business rules, so maybe there is a constraint that the patient cannot be taller than three meters, yeah. uh, for example. This is usually enforced by business rules where the, the receiver's database can say, no, no, um, this is not, this is probably wrong. And um, believe me, in Europe, there's a lot of those um, business rules. So there's a whole list of business rules uh, that we have to apply for. But this is, this is fine. These are just consistency checks, which are normal. You should have those consistency checks in your safety database anyways. So if this, this happens, if, it's, if the message is not valid or you violate such business rules, you need to send the message again. You have to make the correction and send it again, right? Um, and only then, once, once a proper message uh, is received, uh, actually then the clock stops. So the clock, uh, the, the stop of the clock does not really count if the message was not valid. So you, the first time you send a valid message uh, and the message can be loaded, this is when, this is when then this, this time stamp uh, really counts for compliance. That's the idea of the acknowledgements. Um, now, what, what happens when the database could load this ICSR? Um, ideally, it's green, yeah, so the ICSR could be loaded just without anything, but there might be also yellow examples where there must maybe some warning. There's a warning, for example, the patient is two meter 10. Yeah, just stay with the example. Maybe check that again. Is it really true? Or well, the patient was 115 years old. It's not. It's it could be right, but maybe you check this again. I mean, just to give an example, what a warning could look like, we could call it also a soft check. Yeah, it's a, um, um, it's some, you know, some something that you should look at. Yeah, so I think this is the obligation of the sender to not just make sure that your messages are sent, but also to review. If you get a warning, review what's in there. Uh, you might get questions uh, from the regulators otherwise. Why you why have you not acted on those warnings? Um, and the, I think, you know, all of this is fine, but there's one step missing, which is this one. Uh, sorry, this one. There is a list, right? So this, only the sender knows, only the sender knows what is complete and what's not complete. The receiver will never know if a certain message was not received. Yeah? So, so if there was any problem on the sender side to upload this, this document, and first, uh, even before step one, the receiver wouldn't know, so the sender, in addition to making sure that everything that was sent has a positive acknowledgement, the sender has to track that everything that was supposed to be sent is complete and check it off. Yeah, so this, this way, uh, and this is the obligation of the sender, this way we can make sure that nothing get lost, uh, get lost in, this, in this framework. Um, finally, there is um, some more uh, information about the Q&A documents. Um, so a lot of principles, uh, since the standard is so old, um, have been already tested uh, and a lot of scenarios came up in the real life, uh, so to speak, um, that were then uh, uh, put into a question and answer document. Um, here's, an, here's a reason why there will be a sooner revision of the implementation guide because this Q&A is now being looked at 
and everything that is an additional explanation on a specific section of the implementation guide will be updated, it will be integrated. Because the Q&A is so long, uh, we need to, whatever is really important for the IG needs to go to, into the IG. If it is just an example, yeah, or some scenarios uh, that are anticipated, it will stay in the Q&A document. Yeah, so you will soon see a revision of the IG and it will mainly be about integration of certain Q&As. It has been easier to update the Q&As. <laughs> Uh, and the revision of the implementation guide is a, long, is a lengthy process. That's why uh, it's only done in, in certain periodicity. Um, I will skip over the next slide a little bit. Uh, so as I explained, M2, uh, the ICH M2 group is facilitating um, the review of the ICH standards um, and helps also E2B in order to, you know, to explain certain technical options that we have and there's um, one that comes now in the next section which talks about the future updates. Um, this one are the take home messages. I won't read them out uh, for you. You can read them for yourself. You can also find them later in the, in the book. So if you have not been uh, familiar with E2B, maybe this is a good page for you uh, to look at. Um, is there anything on here that I did not talk about yet? Let me just quickly check. Yeah, native language verbatims, maybe the third one from the bottom. Uh, can hold native language verbatim. So um, this is also an update with E2BR3. Uh, it is possible that certain elements are actually exchanged in the original language. So if it's important for the regulator, they would tell you, please put in the original verbatim. What did the patient say? What did the doctor say explicitly? Do not just code it and don't translate it into English. Please tell us how it was expressed in the local language in the original document. Uh, another item is that it can hold, this is the fourth from the top, can, uh, no, so, sorry, uh, the fourth from the bottom. The message can store the original source file. So you could theoretically send the original source file. For, because of data privacy, this is usually not done, uh, but where it's used actually is in literature. So oftentimes, literature articles are then transmitted with the E2B message. That's quite convenient because you don't just have to cite the article and then the receiver has to look it up. You can send the actual article with it and then the for the reviewer it's quite easy and they don't have to go to another uh, system. Um, you will hear about the regional implementation guides in the next um, session so I will skip this in the interest of time because I want you to uh, be updated on the current topics. Um, so this is um, basically following up on this, uh, uh, on this ICH code list uh, for the observed study type. So there was an update or is an update in the ICH E2D guideline. Um, how to really uh, code market research programs, digital platforms, patient support programs, cases that are coming from there. So in the future, this is not final, but it might look like that. Um, this is the current proposal. Uh, there will be uh, next to clinical trials, individual patient use and other, there will be uh, PSP, so patient support program, market research program, and organized data collection scheme with source data from a digital platform, so active online listening, uh, basically, will be added uh, as explicit um, code, uh, code values. Yeah? So this is a contribution to the, uh, you know, to the new data types or new case types that have been really increasing, um, P, uh, like, like where do we receive the, like a lot of cases from PSPs, market research, and from from Facebook, yeah, active online listening. This is a huge source and the regulators and everyone wants to know for their signal detection, okay, so what's the, what's kind of the weight of this case? Is that a case from the internet or is that a case that was reported um, by, by a physician? Yeah, this, this makes quite a difference. So that's why this will be coded um, and in the future it will then be easier to distinguish between those case types. Um, and then Another hot topic um, currently is that um, ICH E2B is now kind of evaluating something that goes on in this in this ISO HL7 standard. Because the standard is already uh, very old, like every five years it's reviewed um, by ISO and HL7 and now, so it has been reviewed again after 10 years. And they have um, seen that, um, yeah, ISO meanwhile Oh, no, sorry, HL7 has moved on uh, to a, a standard that's called FIRE. This is how you pronounce it, F-I-H-I-R, FIRE standard. I know that in such a building you're not supposed to say this word so often, FIRE, yeah, so it's, it's not uh, meant to be 
uh, something that's burning, but it's uh, it's an abbreviation, still has the little flame as a symbol because it's pronounced like that. You will hear this very often if you are uh, in this space because there's currently a debate going on what should be done with the standard. Now, um, let me say it like this. Um, ISO, HL7, and, uh, and hence this fire standard will probably move on. They will probably move to that standard, uh, but it's also very well uh, acknowledged that the, IC, the current E2B R3 um, standard is very yeah, well um, established globally, and they cannot just exchange it with something completely new. Everybody would need to update their systems. That would be a nightmare. Um, so I think the way that it's currently looked at is um, that this new standard um, has some advantages to collect data from from a healthcare system kind of directly. It has also the option to include some patient data, which in the future might become much more important, like genomic data. Yeah, so the, the world is moving on, right? It's so so I think this standard uh, will provide options uh, for us to to um, yeah include more data into the into the cases, um, but it will probably live on like besides the current standard. Um, if something will start now, it's going to take five to ten years at the minimum until something is implemented on the ICH level. Um, but this is the discussion currently. And the discussion is mainly um, how much does ICH E2B want to get involved? So should there just be, uh, you know, a, a more technical revision that this fire standard can be used and that would not require any... Uh, any activities, I think, from the E2B group because it's just kind of, uh, you know, a change in the XML structure um, with with a kind of a proposal that the current structure would still be acceptable. But the question really is, do we want to make use and exchange genomics data? Now, as you may know, uh, in the MHRA, uh, they are uh, starting databases for genomics data and so on. So, you know, it might become a very important topic uh, in a few years. Uh, and if it takes five to ten years to implement such, such a standard, we, we need to figure out now uh, what to do. Um, and then, last but not least, um, there is currently still training material um, under review by the ICH group. This is also going on for some time. Uh, so trainings similar to this one for the basic standard, uh, also for the technical implementation, are currently uh, developed and will also be recorded as, as video and will then be uh, released sometime after the Prague meeting, which is happening now in November, um, probably to, yeah, uh, to the public. So then you will not just find the IG and some Q&A, you will find videos on the ICH websites that are providing kind of training uh, on the general principle, like a little bit like the one today, uh, but also going then into three uh, sections and one is specifically for very technical uh, people. All right, um, I think that was it for today. Yeah. Okay, any one question?